we go. How's it going? Charles Botenston here from BPI. If you guys have any questions, obviously uh, leave it in the comments below. This is a question I get way too often. I said we have to actually answer this. So we're gonna continue in this theme of renting versus buying, okay? Renting versus buying, obviously it comes down to the marketplace and you know, is it a hot marketplace? Is it stale? Is it a normal market? Is it a buyer's market, seller's market, renter's market? You know, there, there's so many different types of markets. You know, uncertainty in the market. So I'm not actually talking about that because that's, that's obviously subjective. But when it comes to evergreen content, if you wanna talk about that, this is the best way to look at it is, it comes down to cost and time whether you're gonna rent or you're gonna buy, all right? So I wrote down a couple things and we'll just go over them. Uh, so first of all, when you buy, obviously it's completely different than renting. When you buy, you're obviously on the hook for insurance, common charges, mortgage if you have it, uh, repairs, things like that. So there are a lot of fees that come along. So in other words, if you look at it monthly, if you put down 20% and you finance 80%, it's a little bit different than if you put down more money because the cost of living, and there is an equilibrium. And the equilibrium to me, you know, honestly, it really comes down to roughly about 40% down, which is actually a lot. But then your, your monthlies come down, Obviously, if you're an investor, it's totally different. You have to put down probably more, like more like 75 to 80 percent, to actually not only break even, but also to make money. Obviously, as an investor, it's about the appreciation, it's about making money in the future, but it's also about cash flow. So, obviously, if you can't afford all cash, then obviously you have to go with the financing. You have to put down as much as you can to actually make a return. Rent is gonna go up, depends on the market, if you buy low. Continue on. So the benefits of renting are a lot. You know, it's flexible. You can move whenever you want, obviously on a yearly basis. You can actually sort of upgrade, but not really upgrade, which we'll talk about buying. So the flexibility about testing that in neighborhood. Obviously, if you move to LA, Miami, New York, Chicago, Boston, you wanna find out, okay, is this the area I wanna live in? Highly recommend if you're new to a city that you actually end up renting. If you've never lived in the city, obviously you wanna find out, is this gonna be good for me? You test out the commute, you test out what's around there, the nightlife, are you single? Then you, you live downtown in Manhattan. If you're not, you know, you live in Midtown or, or Uptown where it's a little bit quieter, you don't have all the extreme chaos on weekends and parades and things like that. So going on from that is that the actual personal and preference of not only the neighborhoods, but your actual commute, a lot of people, ironically enough, the, it, it comes down to neighborhood or the commute, okay? So if you live in a really nice neighborhood, or not a nice neighborhood, if you live in a very popular neighborhood, then you're obviously gonna be spending a lot more for that. If you're talking about Manhattan, it's obviously Tribeca, Soho, West Village, right around there. And then it starts getting a little less expensive once you start hitting Midtown, and then obviously Upper East Side is a little bit less expensive than the Upper West Side. Upper East Side has way more inventory, but it's also not as popular. When it comes down to benefits of renting, you also have all-inclusive renting. You don't have to pay for mortgage. All the trash, all the electricity within the building, you know, heating, hot water, all is included, as well as anything that, that actually has to be repaired is usually picked up by the landlord, whether that's an appliance, that's lighting, that's plumbing, things like that. I do recommend renter's insurance. That's kind of like within the four walls of your apartment or five or whatever amount of walls that you have. And then also you can get your finances in order. So in other words, if you're looking to buy in the future, you can rent something, maybe a studio, and then buy a one bedroom. But during that time, you want to be able to, you know, stow a bunch of money away that's when renting really becomes uh, a great not only option but it's also something where am I gonna be in the future am I dating someone that we could be moving in together do I have am I gonna be getting a dog am I gonna be moving out to the suburbs am I gonna be moving to another city I don't know where my job is gonna be you know that flexibility is very beneficial um, for myself obviously continuing on for the the benefits of buying you know, I'm always pro buying, and obviously historically over the last 20 years, not obviously, but I'll tell you, historically over the last 20 years, it's increased the, the equity within homes 6%. That's obviously going through the Great Recession. Um, we're obviously past that, that time frame of the dot-com bust or whatever, you know, right around then where 
the market, then 9-11 went down for about six, seven months and then it shot up. And then it kept on going up till about 2006, 2007 in New York City, 2008, it hit the rest of the country, then 2009, it hit New York City. So if you wanna look at just a, an appreciating asset, it's, it's a physical asset, you can see it, you can feel it. Um, I'm so pro buying, it's, it's not even funny. So not only the, the equity, but you're not paying down the landlord's mortgage. So if the, the landlord bought a six unit building or a 10 unit building or whatever the size is, unless they paid cash, they have a mortgage on it. So you're essentially paying down, not your mortgage, but you're paying down the landlords if you're renting. When you're obviously buying, you can do whatever you want. You can put down 50%, 80%. Uh, you can then, you know, another one is the, the tax deductions, you know, obviously consult your accountant and obviously it depends on how much money you make and how much money you have stowed away. There's co-op, there's a co-op mortgage that you can write down. It's very little, then you have obviously your insurance. The co-op has taxes, city, state, federal taxes. And with regards to the actual equity within your home, you know, th this is something that a lot of people, I have a client that's actually taking advantage of this where they actually are borrowing against the equity that they've built up. They've been living there for 10 years. They're gonna be taking out a bunch of that money and putting it in and keeping the home, renting it out and then buying something else. Obviously home equity line of credit, that's completely up to you, your banker, your finances, but that is the best way to actually build up your real estate empire. You know, that's, that's everyone's, if you really look at the wealthiest people in New York City, in the United States, it's finance and it's real estate, you know, especially in New York City, it's, it's mainly real estate and it's people that actually either are developers or they're people that just manage a tremendous amount of inventory. So in other words, a lot of rentals that, so what they do is they buy a building and then they put down 50, 60% or whatever amount they, they put down. They then take that cash flow, they buy another building, keeping the other building. And then from there, they just slowly start building it up over the course of a year or two. And they buy in areas that are up and coming. You know, a great area that's up and coming is kind of, it's a little discovered now. You know, Brooklyn is very overpriced, uh, not overpriced, I should say. It's, it's very saturated right now. It's, it's at an extreme level. Developers have just overdeveloped in Queens as well. So there's a couple areas, uh, the Bronx is a, is a great area. And then there's just kind of this liver between probably 135th and about 175th on the Upper West Side that still has a lot of room for growth. Honestly, I would say, because Columbia is up there, Columbia is buying and selling, or I'm sorry, they're buying and holding a ton of real estate up there. But then once you start going to like Inwood and things like that in upper Manhattan, it becomes very neighborhoody. Uh, you know, the trees, the parks, you know, easy transportation, and obviously the cost is a lot less. So that's a great area. But if you're actually looking at not only the, the benefit of buying, you're kind of holding it in an area, say Williamsburg 15 years ago, or downtown Brooklyn 15 years ago. Those are areas that aren't as popular. If you bought in there, you're doubling or tripling your investment by far. And obviously the, the creative freedom. So this is one of the best things, you know, in my my rental, I can't really renovate. You know, my, my door, someone poked a hole in my door and I have to buy the door. But the thing is, I'm kind of upgrading the asset that I don't even own. You know, if you don't like the appliances in a rental, you can't really change it out. You could, but you can't bring it with you. You're just upgrading someone else's appliances. You're adding equity and you're adding home value to someone else. When you own in your own house, and I've talked about this, don't over renovate. I just got a, an Instagram uh, message yesterday from someone and they and they said, yeah, I, I kind of over renovated. They put in way too much money and I said, you have to live there to actually recoup those costs. I have another client, they over renovated. I said, listen, you gotta, you gotta live there for another three to four years for the, the actual price to meet how much money you've put in there. But in general, if you do it right and you you maybe spend 60% of what you, you should pay, you're gonna be able to upgrade your apartment. Obviously you can charge more for that and you know, talk with a professional about what you should be upgrading. You know, what, the first thing I do when I uh, enter a house is, you know, 
the furniture. Should we leave the furniture? Should we take the furniture? Then they say, should we paint? Should we do the floors? Should we do the kitchen? Should we change out the appliances? Do we need to virtually stage or physically stage? You know, th these are questions that you have when you're putting your home up for listing, but you should always be thinking about this. You know, should I upgrade the shower head? That small little rain shower head is something that we can talk about. Even even a, a glass door in a bathroom, is it sliding? Is it is it there? And then you walk around. That's all aesthetics. That's all pleasing to a buyer. So. That's pretty much it. When it comes down to credit, we're gonna be talking about tomorrow. And if you guys have any questions, obviously reach out. But essentially, I would probably boil it down to, to two things. Number one is the benefits of renting, it comes down to flexibility and just getting your finances in order. The benefits of buying is obviously building equity. That's the that's by far the biggest, you know, imagine that where you can physically see your asset instead of a stock or a bond or annuity. And you can actually say, that's my apartment. I live in my apartment, I own my apartment. Apartment. I can rent out my apartment so long as they allow it. I can renovate my apartment. You can do whatever you want, you know, as long as it's legally within the bounds of the law and obviously the condo association, co-op association. So if you guys have any questions, leave in the comments below. This is going to be a continuation of uh, essentially the, the buyer's uh, guide that we're compiling. It's going to be like a 25-part series. So if you guys have any questions, leave in the comments below. Have an amazing day.